driven 300 kilometers to Mutare, initially charged with attempting to leave the country illegally. Yes, the clear formality, when you talk of uh, immigration and uh, Zimu, everything was done above board. He actually presented himself to me and I cleared him uh, legally uh, according to the immigration law. As we move forward, as your Prime Minister, I can assure you that the culture of impunity, of violation against human rights must end and it must end today. This assurance was to prove easier said than done. While ministers and deputy ministers were sworn in, Roy Bennett was to remain in remand prison in Mutare for three weeks. Under the agreement, ZANU retained control of all the security forces, but as a compromise it agreed to share the Minister of Home Affairs which controls the police. In a further show of power play, ZANU-PF unconstitutionally increased their number of cabinet ministers and deputies by five. MDC considered by adding four to its own total. Zimbabwe, bankrupt and on the verge of collapse, found itself with a massive and costly cabinet. The wary populace was quite sure what was needed, and this wasn't it. No nurses in the, in the hospitals, no, do, no doctors. There is a problem of multiple ownership of farms. So what we want addressed and addressed yesterday is one man, one farm. We expect a government that will make education accessible. On February the 12th, the new Prime Minister visited the political detainees in Chikurubi. And eight weeks after the initial court order on medical attention, Justina Mukoko and Fidelis Chiramba were finally examined at the Avenues Clinic. They were not, however, initially permitted to be admitted, which was the urgent recommendation of their doctors. Instead, they were returned to prison. This decision was overturned by the magistrate the following day, and they remained hospitalized, if under armed guard, for the next three weeks. It appeared that the MDC was powerless to enforce the rule of law. The old guard remained in firm control of all branches of the security forces, and human rights abuses were set to continue. The new prime minister, deputies and ministers, set about trying to make sense of their new portfolios and deal with the practical problems. Harare Hospital had not been visited by a prime minister or president for decades. The hospital had been barely functioning for months, some departments lying idle for years due to neglect and lack of funds. The prime minister was given a rousing welcome. But the press were more interested in the unresolved issues of the political agreement. There's the issue of uh, governors, the issue of the governor of Reserve Bank, the issue of permanent secretaries. We discussed a wide range of issues, and I think we established an understanding. I wouldn't be here if we had a disagreement. But the fact remained that the detainees were still behind bars, despite being granted bail. We were given a bail, but the state appealed to the Supreme Court, so it means that uh, the accused persons for now are going to remain in custody. Finally, on March the 4th, all political detainees, apart from Tlamini, Mudzingwa and the journalist Manyere, were released on bail. I think I deserved this freedom from long back. I wasn't even supposed to be away from my home for 90 days. I'm able to go and see my family now. After five months in detention for no reason. Roy Bennett's release had also been ordered by the High Court. In the normal course, Roy ought to be released if they respect the judge's decision. But uh, I think we know that uh, respecting court orders has not been something that the Attorney General does. On the same day, Changirai, having been sworn into Parliament, delivered his maiden speech. Restoration of the rule of law was a key point. The fact that some of these individuals have been incarcerated for months without trial smacks of political persecution. This will not be tolerated under your government. Justice must be done. 
and it must be seen to be done. Yes. Two days later, on March the 6th, tragedy struck. Morgan Changirai and his wife Susan left Harare for a celebration in their home area, Buhera. The car in which they were traveling was sideswiped by an oncoming truck. The Prime Minister escaped serious injury. But Susan Changirai, his deeply loved wife for 30 years, was killed. <laughs> People were both grief-stricken and angry. Despite Mugabe and ZANU-PF's condolences, there was widely held suspicion that this was a cynical plot to kill the Prime Minister and derail the power-sharing agreement. Not even Changirai's own announcement to the contrary quelled this belief. There are always speculations. But in this case, I want to assure you that uh, if there was any foul play, it's probably one in a thousand. It was an accident, but unfortunately, it took a life. On March the 11th, Exactly one month after the inauguration of her husband as Prime Minister, and ironically two years to the day that Morgan Changirai and other senior party and civic activists had been brutally beaten by the police, Susan Changirai was laid to rest in Buhera. There was a real fear that the already frail implementation of the power-sharing arrangement would falter beyond repair if the Prime Minister was unable to carry on. <laughs> While the Prime Minister took a short break, other members of the cabinet had to get on with the most pressing issues facing the country. We don't know accurately uh, how many teachers are in schools at present. We don't know uh, how many school children are attending our schools. We don't know accurately what the physical condition of many of our schools is, is like. If you are not brave, we say you are? Cowards. Hey, cowards. Yes. If something is not big, it is... Yes? Small. It is small. small. If you are not tall, Josiah is... Short. <laughs> We don't have tests for the children. Some of these children are very despised and they are not able. So it's very difficult for us teachers, the children are struggling to survive. We are just about to, to enter into negotiations with the trade union trying to find money to, to pay them adequate uh, levels. My colleagues in the trade union movement themselves have an almost impossible task uh, because on the one hand they know that the treasury coffers are bare and yet on the other hand they have members um, who cannot come out, who cannot even pay the fees of their own children. We are fully supportive of uh, the government of national unity. But nonetheless, we must also make it a point that we also have a membership to look after. These kids, when we teach, sometimes they laugh at us. They say teachers have no money, so it is so embarrassing. But I love my profession. For the first time ever, women from both sides of the political divide joined together to celebrate International Women's Day at the end of March. We want decent work, decent life, and we want a stop to violence.
on the ground, the sewage was still flowing. But with MDC-controlled elected town councils in operation, there was evidence in some areas at least of public consultation around the problems. As in every other area, the chief stumbling block was money, or lack of it, with which to halt the decay. The result of these public meetings was that the proposed Harare Council budget was slashed in accordance with the demands of the people. By the end of March, the Prime Minister was back home and also back to work. I'm actually gratified that the government has taken this uh, culture of consulting the people. You are not free when you cannot access information that you want. You are not free when you cannot move and associate with any other person that you want to associate with. Of particular importance is the restoration of the rule of law. For there can be no economic growth without the rule of law. And without economic growth, this government will not be able to fully address the humanitarian crisis our country is facing. The anticipated renewal of investment and donor funding was not materializing. There were new factory closures, leaving workers on forced and paid leave. Our employers are saying that when the unity government came into existence, they thought that things would be uh, easy, uh, as we would get a lot of support from the international world, but the funding is not coming. It appears the former uh, government chefs, those that were holding the, 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 the reins of power, it appears they are still holding those reins of power. There is no freedom of uh, uh, freedom of speech. There is no freedom of association. Uh, these farm invasions are still continuing on. Uh, in short, it means the rule of law uh, is absent from 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 our country. There is no rule of law. In short, Robert Mugabe had a different explanation for the crisis. Human rights, democracy, rule of law are mere guises that, that, that hide the real reason why they are sanctions. The sanctions, as you know, were first imposed when we refused that um, representative of the European Union who had come here wanting to observe the elections, but he had come as a tourist. Uh, the ZANPF uh, government has been using sanctions as an excuse so that people do not make uh, the government accountable for the state of the economy, the state of uh, the governance in, in the country. If you recall, uh, sanctions, the so-called sanctions, which are restrictive measures, travel bans that were imposed um, beginning mid-2001, uh, that happened as a response to the deteriorating governance in the economy. And then they had to, to get excuses or reasons for the sanctions they had imposed afterwards. This, this is how the sanctions started. We are not even able to deliver commodities of agriculture. Has our agriculture been sanctioned? The answer is no. You remember the problems that Zimbabwe had with the international financial institutions in the late 90s? Basically as a result of the lack of fiscal discipline. And things came to a head in February 2000 when Zimbabweans rejected the draft government constitution. And when that happened, I recall vividly that immediately thereafter, that's when the state-sponsored violence started and the land grab started in earnest, immediately after government lost. We know that uh, from the point of view of the British, it is really the land issue that, that, that uh, pained them. The fact that we held our own as we proceeded giving land to our people and insisting that it was 
the responsibility of Britain to pay compensation. Well, uh, if you've got problems with Britain and America, there are fora through which you can deal with Britain and America. But if you've got problems with Britain and America, and you use it as a basis to torture your people, to unleash violence on your people, I think you're backing the wrong tree. Even countries that were very friendly to Zimbabwe, like Libya, we ended up having problems. Because Libya tried to assist us, and then they realized that we were not prepared to pay for the fuel, for the oil we were getting from Libya. We just wanted a free lunch. And that relationship, you know, broke down as a result of lack of mutual accountability. Zimbabwe just wanted to receive free gifts, but nobody was prepared to give those free gifts because we did not have the capacity to repay. And it's not surprising that Zimbabwe recorded such astronomical levels of inflation, 231 million at the last official count in July 2008. That is directly a product of the misguided policies. That was a direct result of the printing of money, which is not backed by any commodities that are being produced. So basically, a government that comes now and says, well, it's because of sanctions that we are in this uh, uh, paralysis. He's basically trying to use the, you know, sanctions as a small screen. The land has been abused. The so-called land redistribution has been abused. <laughs> there are people with six farms, and I will not name them. I have not come here to point, to point fingers. The farmers who owned these farms which now have been designated and have been offered to new landowners in accordance with our land acquisition law, must respect that law. And they must vacate those farms. They must vacate those farms. They must vacate those farms. Since the formation of the unity government, there had been an upsurge of fresh farm invasions. Uh, we have uh, a continuing escalation of farmers being jambanja. This uh, is an on-farm siege situation where over a number of weeks farmers are uh, forcibly and uh, violently, in, in most cases, a victim of their properties. This Zimbabwe is for black people, not for white. Richard and I don't want to meet you. I don't want to even speak to you. You don't, so what are you doing on the property? You don't want to speak to anybody. Because it's my property. Thank you. This is part of the land redistribution program. Of course he's going to see it as an invasion. But he knows perfectly well that there's an offer letter for this farm. No, on the 2007 she got an offer letter. This farm was never gazetted. So she tried to just move in. She's had four court orders against her. Uh, we've got a static ruling against her. And we've got a final order that we cannot be prosecuted for living on this farm. She just barged in and moved here on her own, uninvited. Very brave. You better take his magazine.